There is no way other people are not going to buy this asset. If you've held a cash reserve for a few years that has not been touched, that indicates to you that you have a significant amount of cash. Dwindling in purchasing power that could have been used as a Bitcoin treasury. If you've got a profitable business and you can make the decision, then you can use Bitcoin in two ways on your balance sheet. One, as an intangible asset and as basically a store of value on your balance sheet as a treasury item. And two, you can take payment in Bitcoin as well. It takes away a lot of headaches that take a lot of time with lawyers and take a lot of time with accountants and take a lot of energy from you running your business and allows you to just focus on organically growing your business in the manner that you know best. You don't have to overcomplicate the matter. It's a realisation that your money will be worth more in the future than it is today. That solves a lot of society's issues and it solves attitudes and it solves a lot of mental health issues for people. That is a tough question to end on. How did you get in, uh, in Bitcoin and how was your personal story in Bitcoin? Um, my personal story in Bitcoin, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure like everybody, if I, if I was to tell the entire story, it would be it would be quite a quite a long tale. Um, and I did cover it recently on, on a podcast on on uh, Once Bitten with Princey. So without going into too much detail, um, my story with Bitcoin starts when, I suppose, of course, when, you, when you're growing up and you kind of learning about money and you're building what your ambitions are and I, I, I grew up in um, quite a, what you would just call normal area um, and had a pretty normal upbringing very fortunate with you know great parents and all that kind of thing and, and I went to the closest school to my house um, but as a as a youngster I was always absolutely certain I wanted to run my own business um, when I was probably a young kid, I assumed that business would be buying and selling second-hand cars, which would have been my passion as a child, like looking at, at cars. And then as I've gone to university, I've still not known what I wanted to do in life and changed courses because quantity surveying wasn't for me and did quite a generic business course along with playing sport. So as I've left university, I had the, the choice really between staying or going into a graduate scheme that was, here's your guaranteed salary, it's going to be a good salary, here's your career path for the next 20, 30, 40 years, and it's going to be steady. Or to take the riskier route of going into like a, a really high sort of sales environment, so recruitment, which is low basic salaries, high commissions, and a, a tough sort of end of the recruitment spectrum permanent placement headhunting which might for those who, who aren't familiar with the industry if you place one person every month then you're doing well in that marketplace if you place two you're doing very well so it's not like um, a high volume of sales and obviously because you're placing people that person might change their mind at the last moment and decide that they're staying in the company that they wanted to that they're already working for so you'll you have a very sort of roller coaster up and down in that one month you feel like a hero and the next month you are the person who lost the only deal that you had going on and you've blanked and you are sort of on the receiving end of of the sort of changing room chat in the office um but I, I chose that industry with a very low basic salary and a high risk which are kind which kind of when you when you look back at becoming a Bitcoin is is a bit of a reflection on everybody in Bitcoin has been through that period where they've not really known um the certainty of the outcome, but they've started to become a Bitcoiner and they've accepted that there is a high chance of volatility and there's a high chance of risk. So within the first two years of my career, in that the first year I was, I became very good at it after the first six months. I was probably in an office with, say, 25 really experienced consultants. And at the end of that six months, I was doing pretty well. And I was just a very overconfident 22 or 23-year-old. Um, and I had a client who was um, living the kind of fiat lifestyle that I eventually wanted to get to at some point. And that client um, invited me out to his villa took us out on his yacht with his wife and his son and wanted me to join his business basically so i had a weekend with the client and he took took me out on his boat that was called if you can think of a fiat equivalent um well it was a very fiat name um spare change would be the closest i could 
could give you to the boat without doxing him. But that kind of, he, he owned a plane, he owned a boat, he had a business that was turning over probably about 15 million and making a couple of million profit. So at the end of my first year in work, albeit I was on probably 13,000 pounds a year at the time and earning good bonuses if I got good deals in, I was being exposed to people and my client base were people who were very successful business owners. So I had a really quick window of time where my skill set became just speaking to people who own businesses, understanding what their business is, understanding their story, understanding where they want to take the business in the future, and then helping to basically find good people who would assist that business in doing that. So I joined him for a while and got all the trappings that came with it, which was a basic salary that actually allowed me to cover my rent over a month and have a bit of money to go to a pub and go on holiday and that sort of thing. But he also, to, to, to secure me on board, kind of let me use his little speedboat if I was on holiday in Spain or um, part of the offer he made to me was to, because I was 22 at the time and I, 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 was, I was pretty confident um, in my conversations with clients but the reality was I was living in a really uh, sort of student type flat with a mate and we were we were we were I think I said this on the one we were kind of sneaking through the um turnstiles at the train station every morning and, and saving as much money as we possibly could just to go out on a Thursday night and a Friday night. So I've joined him to acquire businesses for him for twelve months. I didn't really know what I was doing, but we managed to get a couple. And at the end of that 12 months, I thought I'd, I'm not enjoying the safety and security of of having a better basic salary, but no hope for the future. As in, is the big payday ever going to come? No, it's not. You're guaranteed to earn this amount every month until you get an increase of 10% or you know 20% if you're lucky. But every year you're, you're going to get an incremental salary increase and your life might get slightly better. And without really understanding at the time, I probably had a bit of an intuition. I think a lot of Bitcoiners have that inflation is kind of put out in two baskets by the media or your government. And one is CPI, if you want to buy really average items that don't really change your life, such as tins of beans, bread, fuel, um, necessities to live. And the other area of assets are appreciating assets. So... I was seeing the appreciating assets kind of get away from me and I'm trying to save for a house and thinking, well, every, every year I'm saving up for this house, this house is becoming further and further away from me. So I'm sort of, in my personal life, I'm filling a bucket that's leaking and I don't really know what to do with the money. So I, I, I decided to set up my own business and I was probably 24 by this point. So I'd done one year in the high sort of, um, highly risky industry of recruitment where you're either going to be really good at it and you're going to succeed or you're not going to be good and a lot of people leave the industry pretty early if they, if they just can't sort of uh, take to that environment. And I'd done one year with a good basic salary and a pretty secure role. And I knew what I wanted to do. I, I wanted the risk and I enjoyed the stress and I decided, right, okay, I'll, I'll set up by myself. And I set up by myself in the kitchen and within the first 24 hours, I'd, I'd landed a deal that was like a a medium sized deal. And I thought, well, if, if I can if I can just call good people who I know want to leave their position and put them in touch with good business owners who I know will want to hire them and want, want them in their business and earn from that, then that fits my skill set. So I set up that business and in the first year, it was glorious it was just me working for it i had no overheads it was just you're in the kitchen you've got a laptop you're making phone calls and you know if you have success you have success but there's zero responsibility or risk in that within say the first 12 months I had a client give me an office um as part of a deal instead of paying for the placement and as as i started um gaining liabilities I, I was very conscious that i did not want to take on I, I had this sort of vision that i wouldn't take on any debt in the business i would 
keep the business free from any liabilities. So contracts on company cars, um, rent for offices, people's salaries. So in, in say, let's say the second half of that first 12 months, I had friends working for me on commission only that were earning quite highly. I had an office for free and I had no, um, if I wanted to stop on that day, I could stop on that day. And as, as they, as the person who gave me the office lost their business and I had to purchase um, a, a, a rental agreement, if you like, for an office for 12 months, and then I had to take business seriously and I had to start employing people on full-time contracts. As I moved into that territory where I had financial commitments, I was starting to become aware of Bitcoin. And let's say in that second year of the business, I'm not great with times, I'm not great with dates, but let's say around about that second year of the business, I started becoming aware of Bitcoin and there was only two aspects of it that, that I really understood. And I was just trusting the person who told me about it, that these were facts and that they couldn't change. And them two aspects were there's only 21 million of them and nobody can take it off you unless let's switch word seed phrase for password because I was rudimental in my understanding at this stage. Unless someone has your password, they can't take it from you. They can't send it and it will sit there and it is publicly visible. I didn't know where to, to actually um, see it publicly visible. <laughs> And I didn't really understand how the seed phrases worked or, or, or the level of security that that actually provided you. And I didn't really understand why there could only ever be 21 million of them. I just took them three points and thought, well, this is interesting and I'm going to get some personally. So that's where I started being interested in Bitcoin. It took me a long time to really understand how to, how to send it to cold storage. Um... I'm terrified of actually sending it anywhere else after I've sent it to that one cold storage device. I'm not really sure whether I'm ever going to be able to get it out of this device, thinking that it's inside it, but it's, it's obviously not. And it's at that rudimental stage of um, um, the seeds are being planted for being a Bitcoiner. At the exact same time that my business is starting to get liabilities for rent in 12 months time, um, employment contracts with multiple people where they're on notice periods and it's starting to become a real business. Um, and over, let's say over them next few years, for the only um, sort of thoughts on Bitcoin I had were for myself, but I didn't completely understand the gravity of of what I'd been exposed to and how it would change the world forever, if you like. And I firmly believe it will in the future, even if it's not as obvious to, to the majority of people right now today. So you have the ups and downs with, with, with business and I'm in a volatile business industry where one month you're having an unbelievable month, it's the best month you've ever had and the next month it's difficult and all this kind of thing. And I wanted to move the business from what was a town in the north of England to a city in the north of England that I knew we could find better talent, better level of graduates and have sort of a... Um, the opportunity to grow that company more and grow that company longer term for the better of the staff who we had at the time. Now, I, as my kind of Bitcoin story is going throughout that, I'm, I'm having conversations with friends and I, I, I didn't discover... I didn't discover any good podcasts like this. I didn't discover any good stories of people in Bitcoin. I didn't know anyone in Bitcoin. I genuinely felt a bit like an island and I was trying to have conversation with friends about it to test my theories, and they weren't really giving me uh, particularly good responses to it that would, if you like, um, trigger the further thoughts that you have. So, for example, I'm, I'm speaking to, to friends about Bitcoin, and I said to them, I said, look, if, if, if every um, single millionaire on the planet wants to buy this asset, this asset is going up in value. And then I'm thinking, if every person who's ever needing to leave a partner in the future and doesn't want to disclose what assets they have, they're going to buy this asset. Um, and then you're thinking at the wider extreme, if you're a Russian oligarch and all of a sudden you want to move from Russia to the Caribbean or the Cayman Islands or somewhere in Europe, they're going to want to buy this asset too. So I was starting to think, 
there is no other rational expectation for this asset than it goes up in value when priced in fiat money. So that thoughts, them thoughts are going on in my head alongside running the business, but I've not really put the two and two together yet. And I, I'm speaking to friends about it, and they're kind of just saying, "Shut up, Scott! Like, stop going on about Bitcoin." And I, and I, I've I've mentioned it before, but I, I I look at my WhatsApp messages from back in back in those years, and I think it was probably 2018, which may have been after the crash, um, from sort of 17,000 UK pounds down to 5,000 or whatever it might be. And I'm still trying to get friends to get their head around this asset. And I, and I said, look, for these reasons, which I've just gone through there, there is no way other people are not going to buy this asset. So I'm starting to think about um, tax. I mean, people who are moving to jurisdictions that have got low tax bases are going to buy this asset to move it there. That's an obvious thing. And I'm writing all this out on WhatsApp, and I've still got the message now. And then I put at the end of it, Something else I've also been thinking about, guys, and these are non-Bitcoiners in a WhatsApp group who used to play rugby with or something like that. Something else I've been thinking about is a, a dog Airbnb where you can just, like Airbnb, put your dog in with people who like dogs who've got good reviews and they can pay to look after your dog. And the group, the, res- the first response on it was, I really like your idea about dog Airbnbs. And I'm sat there thinking, I can't believe what I've just said to them all and that's their response to it. So I was starting to think maybe I'm mad or everybody else is mad, but I hadn't found Bitcoin Twitter and I hadn't really realised how many other people were thinking way further down the line than I was. Um, So I got to a point with the business where I was moving the business into a city centre and and getting into a new office and looking to really launch the growth of the business. Now, in that same week where I'm moving into a new office, my mindset is by the time I'm 30 years old, I want to be financially secure for my future children. I don't have any children. I still don't have any children yet. But my mindset was always I want to make sure I'm financially secure for my future children, my future wife, who I also hadn't kind of uh, met in the early years of having the business. I had met at this point. Um, But I want to make sure my family are financially secure forever. And the only way as a business owner, and even when I was leaving university, I believed that was possible, was buying assets that would increase in value that could provide me an income as well, which when everybody who owns a business or everybody who's earning money and saving money, prior to Bitcoin, everybody looked at property, quite often residential property in the UK anyway, and I'm I'm sure that probably resonates further afield. And it was okay. Well, if I buy, if I slowly build up a portfolio of 10 houses and they're all worth £100,000 and I'm earning £5,000 a year from each of them houses, then eventually I will have a portfolio of £1 million worth of houses and I'll have an income that requires very little um, energy of £50,000 per annum. And if I can get to there by the time I'm 30 years old, I will relax and I'll feel better. Now, just before I'd moved business into a city centre, I'd probably had had an experience of buying one property and renting it out, and it was absolutely horrific, and it still is to this day. Tenants going in, tenants coming out, things going wrong, and the, the taxes and the council taxes, and pe- tenants not paying them, and then me being left with the liabilities of them, and the um, energy not being paid for, me being left with liabilities. And I just thought this is the ultimate headache. But I've still got Bitcoin at the back of my mind. I've still not put everything together. And then I moved into the office in Leeds. And literally within seven days, the whole country just shut down for COVID. And I thought, well, there we go. Uh, Right, I need to get this. (laughs) I need to to adapt quickly and make this a scalable business. Get everything in place because this is probably going to last a few months. And then out the back of that, we're going to have a platform that I can scale business on that's secure for all the staff and for me and my future going forward that lasted longer than expected but when you knew it was going to last longer than expected was the moment i really sort of went right now i understand bitcoin is 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 the future because the price had been down for quite a few years 
and I just couldn't understand the outcome of a Bitcoin price being rational. I think if it's just not rational or logical that this is the price, and much the same as I assume you probably um, saw throughout all the other countries in Europe, UK, you saw it in the USA and you saw it all around the world. You had prime ministers and presidents standing up in front of the entire country and saying, don't worry, we are going to print as much money as, as is necessary to ensure that you can all stay at home, that you can all pay your debts, your mortgages, um, or pay for your cost of living, as they now call it. That's all fine. We can print as much money as we need to to look after you all. And it was that moment when he was saying that speech and the whole pub was sort of celebrating that I was just thinking, that's it. They've just opened the box and gone. Mm. It was all a myth. Um, but hope, hoping we don't notice that, that money is, is free to to produce for central banks, governments and private banks as well. Um, especially when the government back all the loans from the private banks. So that was a moment where I thought this is Bitcoin's moment and it is it is going to be far bigger, far quicker than I had anticipated having watched the slow adoption happen from 2016 onwards. I thought the adoption is just going to ramp up at this moment. And it did, but I noticed yesterday, Robin, that you were very fortunate to have um, have a conversation with Michael Saylor. And uh, I went from seeing this happening to watching Michael Saylor with, I think it was Ross Stevens, um, have a conversation where Michael Saylor was being orange-pilled. And I don't know how I found this conversation. I must have been voyeuring on Bitcoin Twitter because at the time... In, in lockdown, you had more time on your hands. I started looking at what people were saying on Twitter. So I had a feel for what the what the sort of um, community was like on there. And I'd seen this video that's going to go on YouTube. And I watched it on YouTube. And I remember just thinking, wow, have I had blinkers on for the last few years? This is going to be the asset that every company in the world has as its treasury asset. Every nation state has its, has, has its treasury asset. And you can now solve the uh, stranded energy problems in Africa and Canada and wherever you want in the world. If you've got a dam or if you've got a solar farm or if you've got a wind farm, you can now monetize that energy and transfer that energy from Africa to um, me if you wanted to, if, 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 I, if I sent you my QR code. And I just thought, wow, my, my, my sort of mindset on it opened up and I just started going that's where I went into the rabbit hole and that's where I, I started thinking the the adoption has started from ground up with people and that started out with people with a low trust in institutions and a high IQ quite often and it has filtered slowly down to people who trust them a little bit a little bit more and a little bit more but still have low trust and the, the people it's going to hit are the people like yourself is going to adopt it. And, and, and there's plenty of people from all different walks of life who've started adopting it individually over these years, up to 2020, maybe 2021. And now you're going to see companies start adopting it. And when, when Sailor adopted it on his balance sheet, I thought, well, this is going to be really easy for me to adopt on mine because I'm a, I'm a, a small to medium enterprise, as you would call it in the UK, an SME. And that, my business turns over um, probably a couple of million and makes a few hundred thousand. And at the time in, in COVID, it was obviously making very little and turning over very little. Um, but I thought, I know where the savings need to be now because I've tried to grow this business organically. And for the last five years, I've been saving a number in a cash reserve bank or a cash reserve account, and then watching the purchasing power of that number devalue every single year. And now I get it. That's all you need to do is put your reserve savings into Bitcoin. So it was really easy for me to start doing it. Um, I, I just opened up an account under the business name um, with an exchange that was trusted and a, a Bitcoin-only exchange 
coin corner. Um, registered a special purpose vehicle to to hoddle it for me because I worried that if it was on my main operating business, that what you wouldn't, that if they change the regulations, it would make it really difficult to, um, well, it, it risked the staff. That was my main concern is I've got to make sure this business is secure and making the best decisions possible for everyone who works within this business, who is going to grow this business. And if I put it on the main operating businesses uh, balance sheet and the government change legislation and say that it's illegal to own Bitcoin on your balance sheet, then I've caused a real issue for my business. So I needed to make a special purpose vehicle, a separate entity that held the Bitcoin and could always transfer the fiat amount back to my main business if that needed to use it. So it was it was that was my orange pill journey really and and it was them sort of three key moments that, that brought me around to just being completely and utterly fully obsessed with Bitcoin and seeing it as the um future for for all aspects of, of people, businesses, nation states, life in general. And I think we might be a few years away from that, but it's slowly, slowly coming. Uh, lo- lovely. You definitely have the the answer length of for Michael Saylor already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking. I, 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 I probably don't put it across as coherently, but I, I yeah. But I, I saw it as a simple, simple owner managed small businesses are the ones who can just adopt it tomorrow and benefit from it the most long term. Whether that's somebody who owns a pub, a restaurant, a bar, a logistics firm, or um, a service-led business like me, where you've just got good people in an office all wanting to work on behalf of clients and, and uh, build a business. If you want to build that business and we want it to be here in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and we, if we want to stay involved in it forever, then we need an asset that's going to live forever on the balance sheet. You mentioned uh, the fear that you had that Bitcoin might be outlawed. Uh, that's why you made that second uh, company. Um, is is that fear still here? Because I'm asking because I had that fear also when I came in in 2020, uh, and right now I kind of don't have it anymore. It's it's for me. It's like the the we, we're kind of this point where it's really hard to imagine now to, that it gets banned. But there are some ways or some scenarios or situation where I'm like, okay, if this and this happens, they might do it. Do you, are you still afraid that this could be the case? Uh, no, no, not, um, not, I wouldn't say not at all, but if that would just be dependent on what jurisdiction you're living in, I suppose. I think I live in, in, in one that um, in the UK, I think they will try and stifle the on ramps, which they have. And I don't necessarily believe they're doing that because they're evil and they don't want people to purchase Bitcoin. I think that the people who are doing that, the regulatory bodies, uh, just have such a lack of understanding and awareness of what Bitcoin is that they believe they're doing the right thing by limiting the amount people can buy and making it difficult to fill in quizzes. That like, I've, I've sat with members of staff who wanted to buy Bitcoin and said, I'll help you sort of get set up to, to do it and looked at the questions are being asked and gone um i don't know the answer to that like, that's a ridiculous question it's worded in a ridiculous manner so i think we might try and slow people purchasing it but i don't think there's any risk of regulation now um outlawing a business having it on the balance sheet and I, I was never worried about it being outlawed on the balance sheet i was worried about changes to how it is um accounted for so at the time I was accounting for it and I still am now as an intangible asset on my balance sheet. And I was strictly instructing my accountants that I do not want that publicly wrote down as this is what the asset is. Just just put the value of the asset and then it's an intangible asset on there because in the future, you, do you really want, like Bitcoin is personal, would never disclose that they own Bitcoin on a public I mean, most of them, uh, people like yourself are, are, are pretty brave pioneers who kind of put their name by what they do. But a lot of Bitcoiners live under pseudonyms and value their privacy. So given that it, given that um, a lot of information is, is publicly available in the UK, 
I wanted to make sure my accounting gave me the least sort of attack surface for the government moaning and saying, right, we're going to... Because what I, what, I, what I kind of thought might happen is uh, taxation of unrealised capital gains. And we know in Bitcoin that no capital gain is necessarily going to be the same six months later as it is right now and that could quite easily turn into a capital loss <laughs> so <laughs> if you're looking at accounting periods you're like I, I just i just want to get this set up and i just want this to be signed off and compliant with the accountants and with our regulations as they are now but i want to make sure i give some protection for if the regulators decide to change the rules where i have some negotiation in it and if you're going to change the rules this business is a separate entity you're gonna to have to have a real conversation with me and i'm gonna to have to explain why this asset is an ethical asset to hold on your balance sheet and in 2020 2021 i didn't know whether they would come around to the sort of realization that it is an ethical asset to hold on your balance sheet you didn't know what kind of um pushback you were going to get but now <laughs> this year i have it on my main operating business and I talk about it pretty openly with banks and whoever I need to. Don't mention it to clients. And I don't talk about it often with staff. Um, I certainly haven't sort of gone through the process of letting them know how the um, treasury is being run. There's, there's no need to with an owner-managed SME. But um, yeah, I, I see that as dissipated significantly. And when the ETS were launched, it felt like that dissipated forever. Yeah, I also feel like that. And and the unrealized gains. I don't know why this this discussion comes up uh, up and again because taxes on unrealized gains is the biggest BS that I ever heard. It's like you 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 still have all the risk uh, in one year and they tax you, and then next year it crashes. Like there, there's no sense in that at all. I mean, taxes in general uh, could be discussed, but on unrealized gains I, I don't see it at all uh, and this is actually a question that i wrote down in, in my preparation um do you think uh, that it's dangerous what i personally do and, and a lot of other uh, bitcoiners in the in the in the sphere do that they, <laughs> that they disclose their full name they are with the I, everybody knows that I'm in Austria. I mean, I don't, they don't know exactly where I am, but they know that I'm in Austria. So Austria is not that big, so you probably can't find me if, if you really want to. Uh, is is that <laughs> is that? Do you find that dangerous? Um, no, I, I, I don't necessarily think it's dangerous. Um, I think it increases risk slightly for the individual. Um, I, I I'm wearing a pair of shades now. But anybody who knows me would, would recognize me. And anybody who knows me would recognize the, the story. The only reason I am half sort of pseudo, I'm using my real first name with you, is because my Bitcoin, just not my Bitcoin, my business lives in an entirely different world to Bitcoin. We work with, um, we work with about probably six different industries, none of which are related to Bitcoin. The clients, we don't speak. I don't speak to my clients about Bitcoin. My staff don't talk about Bitcoin in the office. So for me, what I don't want to do is distract from my day-to-day -day most important focus. So on my Twitter account, I might say stuff that I would certainly not say in the office <laughs> or to a client. So I've got a sort of half doxed um set up for myself but I, I i wouldn't have these conversations with clients and when it comes to um speaking as a business owner you kind of have your hands tied behind your back and you, you can't really disclose your ex the extremity of, of how much change you see bitcoin driving and, and your opinions like as a as a as a business owner, I've never talked about the subjects that you would talk about in the pub with your friends. You know, you don't get into your, your, your thoughts on politics and you don't get into your thoughts on world affairs and you, you don't give your opinion as a business owner. Your, your job is to, to allow the brand to work with all of your clients. And I always sort of say when, you, when you're training staff early stages, you leave, if you took politics, for example, which 
is a subject that drives emotional reactions in people that are not always logical and not always rational. If you put your opinion in relation to any political topic on your work social media platform, the likeliness is you're going to gain a zero benefit from it. You're going to have 50% of your potential clients decide they don't like you. And you're going to have 50% of your potential clients decide they do like you, which means you've now just shrank your potential client base by 50% by mentioning that. And albeit we were saying about the safety of a regulatory environment, yes, I believe that has massively changed since ETFs. And I believe this is changing as well right now, but it may take a few more months and it it might take a few more brave people like, um, I can't remember the name of the scientific firm that has just announced with the the shareholder or the chairman's name on there saying we've just bought $40 million worth of Bitcoin. Take a few more pioneers like that to, to do it on a big scale for it to not divide opinion. So I now, I attend business networking events and I always have conversations about Bitcoin. I always bring it around. So whenever I meet business owners, I always bring the conversation around to Bitcoin. But this is business owners who are not clients. These are business owners who are friends or at functions. And I'm getting a really strong feel that the conversation is never gets the reaction it used to get, which is quite an emotional response. So that's the only reason I don't have my name associated with my Twitter or my company name associated with my Twitter. If I wanted to build a career and if I had the opportunity to go back in time to my mid twenties and I was building a career and I would want that to build that career within Bitcoin and I would use my real name and I would be absolutely all over using, you know, my real name and, and really sort of um, not worrying about the effects. Of course, you invite a little bit of risk, but you might risk in all aspects of life. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. Yeah, that's that's exactly what what, what I'm trying to do. It's uh, I had a decision actually in my head, like I, it was something that I thought intentionally about, do I go all in in social media or do I completely leave it? Or maybe the third way was like, just be pseudonymic. Like there are a lot of accounts out there that yeah. are not that are well known, but you don't know who's behind them. Uh, and I wanted, I was like, I want to be in the Bitcoin community as deep as possible. So I have to go to physical events. I have to be yeah. with my name in there. I have to be with my presence in there. If you have, if you really want to be in an industry, you have to be fully in there. And uh, there's a, a famous example, Bitcoin Gandalf. Uh, he has like 70 yeah. followers. He just uh, announced. <laughs> From completely anonymous to he is now Daniel, uh, and he will be on the show uh, soon also. Uh, awesome. What uh, an amazing account. 
Yeah, an amazing account. And he's now going from that thing. And uh, I will release tomorrow an episode with, with um, uh, Rune, uh, an offer of a thousand years of inflation. And he also is saying, like, if you really want to drive Bitcoin adoption, we have to be proud of it. We have to go out with it uh, and, yeah, and, yeah. and and and, and uh, hide as little as possible, uh, but keep in mind the risks of the personal life because everyone has his, uh, has his uh, things. And uh, I totally understand how you do it. And, and I'm, I, I think you're brave that you're even doing the half doxing because yeah, you, we can see, see you kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, if that's... you meet, if you meet me at an event, uh, so I, I kind of go on a, on a, um, looked into each of us <laughs> eyes basis <laughs> if i've met someone at an event they'll know my full name they'll know where what my business is called i'll i'm happy to to share them and introduce them to you know um introduce them to, to or, or, or bring people i know into the conversation and and let them know a lot about me but on twitter i i, I kind of keep it as you just don't know who's looking at it um, and it just gives you a bit more freedom to say whatever you want to say as well, if you're half doxed. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. And, and by the way, uh, Semla Scientific, I think is the company name. Semla That's Scientific. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, just to, just to, if someone <laughs> wants to look it up, they, they now have a name. Um, you also mentioned something uh, earlier, I remember. Uh, you said something that Bitcoin will change the world and you truly believe that Bitcoin will actually uh, change a lot of the, the fundamentals of the world. This is a question that comes up a lot in my podcasts and I talk a lot about guests with them because there's, there's, there's those two sides of the arguments. The first argument is like, oh, Bitcoin is just money. It doesn't change, <laughs> change the, the person. It's just a tool. But then there's also this other argument where like Bitcoin changes your time preference Therefore, it changes your incentives. And when we one one when we know one thing for sure, show me the incentives of, of a person, and I will show you what this person will do. I think Charlie Munger was the one that uh, uh, coined it or was popularizing that phrase. Um, how do you see it? Like first of all, like you, you believe that Bitcoin will change the world, and, and how will how will this change look like? Um, yeah, I think Charlie Munger said, show, "Show me the incentive, and I'll show you the outcome." Um, and at the moment, the incentives are upside down from the, the, the top of the institutions, right down to, to the individual in a lot of cases, um, which provides bad outcomes. And you can see society's kind of on a slow decline at the moment. And that's a decline in happiness, a decline in mental health, a decline in hope, a decline in ambition, a decline in the actual resources that we or services that have been delivered for a lot of people by governments. And there are exceptions, but generally speaking, I think in, if you look at the US and you look at the UK, that's the feel you get from everyone is, is a scene of a social decline. Um, where I see it, it change the world, I, I can't predict when it will be complete or if it will ever be complete. But if the reserve currency is a sound money, the incentives are more ethical, um, the outcomes for society are more positive and there's more transparent accountability for the people who are in power within a co country and they'll have far less power because the, the subjects, if you like, and, the, and the, the inhabitants of that country will have more choice to leave or stay in that country. They'll have more choice to work with a sound money that's, that's global, that's 24 seven. They'll have more choice to work for anybody around the world and be paid in a currency that, they will um, have more control over, um, I suppose, declaring and entering the contract with the government where they are residing at the time. So, you know, when you get your smaller sort of, um, your smaller states that, that provide incentives for people to go and live there in, in low tax, low tax, low government intervention, high security jurisdictions and it gives people more choice that's a long way away and there are people far more qualified to for me to 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 paint the picture of what that looks like and anything i'm sort of aware of or discussing has has come out of a book written by somebody else or come out of a podcast with somebody more qualified to to um paint the picture of that and i think 
when you listen to Jeff Booth and he kind of puts it simply when he's saying right now and into the future if if you're the the main incentive driver at the lower level individuals and companies is if you're pricing everything in fiat the prices are going up forever and if you're pricing everything in bitcoin the prices are coming down forever that's sort of the bedrock of where the incentives change how it would change the world if you look at people if you look at individuals uh people i speak to and friends have in the uk who are at that level where they're hard working people who are on what used to be a reasonable income and they've got a wife and they've got kids you can see the 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 people say mental health issues are more prevalent in this day and age you can see where there'll be exceptions to what i'm about to say and there are um individual circumstances in every single situation i understand that but if you're working away for a salary monday to friday from eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the evening and seeing your kids for a couple of hours in the evening and your partner for a couple of hours in the evening and watching tv and you've saved up hard to, to buy the house and that's a 10 percent um 10% of the house is yours, the rest is mortgage. You can't see your life improving dramatically in five years' time, 10 years' time, or 20 years' time. You are naturally going to have a mindset that says to yourself, the next 10 to 20 years, things are slowly getting worse for me, and there is very little I can do to correct that. So if you start at that area of society where it's people who are employed, who are hard working and earning good salaries with a fiat currency all the hope and all the ambition and all of the sort of future plans are, 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 are opaque and impossible to see like um i think michael describes it best when he says hope but if you're saving that 100 pounds 200 pounds 500 pounds whatever you can save if you're saving that in a sound money that you whether it increases forever or whether it doesn't whether it increases at five percent a year forever or whether it increases at 20 percent, or whether it shoots up to you know 500 percent gain over the next four years and then drops to it drops down so it was only you know it's 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 lost 50 percent of that 500 percent gain or whatever it is as long as you have the hope and the understanding and the realisation that your money will be worth more in the future than it is today, that solves a lot of society's issues and it solves attitudes and it solves a lot of mental health issues for people. And I think once you solve the sound money savings device for every normal working, employed, ambitious person, in every country and around the world you solve a lot of issues they become happier more motivated more ambitious they start seeing a future for their family and not worrying about having more kids and all that kind of thing and not worrying about what the state of the world will be in 10 or 20 years because it doesn't matter because they've got sound money and they know that that can help them move protect the family and provide a good future for the family and that goes from if you're in the, the poorest areas of the world to the sort of middle classes of the, the first world countries, wherever that is, as long as you know that the money you have today is going to be worth more in the future, then it solves a lot of your sort of um, issues that you might have today. Yeah, and it's, it's it's also fascinating because a lot of people say, "Oh, what what do people do that don't have money left over?" And I'm also saying, even if you can just do with ten euros a month or like fifty euros a month, that's a start. Like start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have you have have to get your your the foot in the door with with saving and getting this mindset. I will save in Bitcoin in sound money a little bit. And then I can accelerate, and this gives you hope. This gives you something to look forward to, and this is uh, this is something that will completely change society, as I also think. And we we probably have zero to no idea how this what effects do those does those changes have. I always like to 
make this example of running on sand versus running on a solid street. On sand, you can still run, but it's a real, little bit harder to, to run. It's a little bit harder to get a, uh, get forward and you are more inclined to just like lay your beach towel out and uh, lay flat on the sand and, and relax. Uh, yeah, on yeah, a solid yeah. street, you are just incentivized to uh, run and, and you, it's easier to run and it's it's nicer to run on, but you still have to run. Like you still have to put your proof of work in and, 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 and do something. And that's that's for me the, the the biggest reason that I wanted to add here. Yeah, it's it's so stressful to to start to own Bitcoin, and that that's I think a massive major barrier for people in in that situation there that you're talking about. And I've I've spoke to, like I've been really fortunate in my career and personal life. I, I've known people from all different sort of walks of life and all different levels of success. So I've spoke to people who've set up and built banks. I've spoke to chairman of banks. I've spoke to really successful lawyers. I've spoke to entrepreneurs who've made ridiculously obscene sort of profits from businesses and, and selling and exiting businesses. Friends who, who who are really sort of successful sports stars. And then I've my friends who I grew up with who were very similar to me in that, you know, they're they're ambitious, but we've all been we've all been up against it throughout our lives. And you kind of feel like you're filling a, a a bucket that's leaking at all times, whether that's in your personal life or whether that's in your business life. The, the sort of in business for me, the more I was doing, the more holes were in the bucket, the more contracts were attached to it, and the, the water's leaking out. The more um, sort of rents, the more taxes it was getting. The, 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 the more you're just just trying to conserve energy in in a in or conserve water, if you like, in a, in a bucket that's got increasing amount of holes in it. And when you're saying about it doesn't matter what it is, it's all relative. If you're if you're certain that your life is going to be improved next year and the year after and the year after, and you've got a goal to go for, then you're in a much better mindset and a much healthier mindset for your kids and for your family and for everyone you spend time with. Um, and I had, a, I had a friend who had a kid um, a few years ago and tried to orange pill him. And he just got it straight away. And he, he's, he's in a um, a tradesman type role. And he's, all, he's always been stressed about money, as we all always are when you're on a, when you're thinking about money in the fiat world, everyone's stressed about it. And he got Bitcoin and he rang me up and he said, like, I've got it. I understand it all. He said, it, I don't think it's going to change my life because I, I I don't have enough money to put into this that's going to necessarily change my life. But what I've done straight away is I've set up an account and I'm putting £50 a month in for my kid and I'm just going to leave it there until he's 18. What do you think of that? I was thinking, well, £50 a month for sort of 16 years into Bitcoin. <laughs> it's like, that's an unbelievable idea. Whereas people used to sort of put it in premium bonds or whatever it might be <laughs> there, there's it allows a, you to do that there's an ex, uh, math example that a guest recently brought up if you were to invest uh, 10 euros the last 10 years every week in bitcoin uh, this would be an investment of 5,000 euros a little bit over 5,000 euros but that would be now over 300,000 euros just 10 euros per week <laughs> That, 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 that that's less than the 50 uh pounds per per uh per month actually so yeah small things add up uh this is i mean the the, the main point here and, and and you sh definitely should uh, do it if you have the possibility I was gonna say, the, the difficulty of moving from that sort of fiat savings vehicle and saving up to buy a property to rent out or whatever it might be to being in a bitcoin savings vehicle is for I don't think there's any way to necessarily do it without going through to, to, to move from saving in the leaky bucket to Bitcoin. You've got to go through a baptism of fire. And if 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 anybody saved in Bitcoin ten do you say ten euros a, a week or Yes, ten ten uh, euros a week for ten years. They, they would have seen their net worth going up to fifty thousand, down to thirty thousand, up to two hundred thousand, down to eighty thousand, up to three hundred thousand now over that period of time. And not everyone can sleep through that kind of drawdown and not everyone can stay relaxed through that kind of drawdown. So 
albeit in the future, I'm saying yes, it does allow the opportunity for hope and, you know, um, solving a lot of issues. In the short term, you do need to prepare people and you do need to kind of make them allocate to the same level that they understand and give them the set their expectations that this is going to be stressful. But over the next four years, you're going to be rewarding yourself mentally with uh, well done you've managed to get through that first four years yeah um, and it's, uh, it's also when when someone is like oh it's so unfair that the early bitcoiners have so much money and i'm like no <laughs> if you've seen if, if you're nobody have no money but you uh bought like a thousand bitcoins back uh back there uh then you saw your net worth like oh it was like 10 euros 20 euros that all of a sudden it was a thousand euros thousand bitcoins now like a huge amount like if you really hold it to that bitcoin amount <laughs> you could sold at any point you could sold at fifty thousand. you could sold at five hundred thousand. but you still did not uh, sell uh and a thousand bitcoin uh, what is it like uh so uh, that's a lot <laughs> a lot of yeah, yeah yeah so, so you go through that cycle and like no, you, you earned that. If you actually still holding that oh, yeah, yeah. amount of Bitcoin, because you did not sell it for a nice car. You did not sell it for a nice house. You hold it on. You hold it on to your lifestyle. You uh, remained humble. That's why we always say stack sats and uh, stay humble. Uh, and he grew a Bitcoin uh, stack. And this, this is uh, something remarkable. Uh, and uh, everybody, and there are not a lot of people that, uh, hold it through the last like 10, 10, uh, 10 yeah. 15 years. Uh, but the, the few that did, uh, like kudos to them. Like <laughs> that's, that's a major. The, the, f- the few that did are usually extremely, uh, intelligent people who, who had so much foresight. Most people you meet who bought for Silk Road will openly say most people you meet that had loads, sold it all. And then, started getting it a few years later which is similar you know right i i had a small amount 2016 i watched it go up i thought i'd made it i watched it drop all the way down sold some on the way down just thinking people are not going to get this for years and it's okay i can buy some back later and it was only like 2020 where people really caught on to what it was long term but when you're on about um brings us back around to incentives that hodling mentality of going through that kind of stress which everyone would have to go through your incentives in life change that's what i'm saying a bitcoin standard brings about a better world it doesn't have to necessarily be right now for reserve currency for that to happen it's just is it your personal reserve currency because if it is it'll change your incentives and the more people understand bitcoin the more they um sort of match up that allocation to conviction and understanding the more their incentives improve. So when it, when I first started a business, I remember thinking in my head, I, I'll know when I've made it. When I've made it will be when I have a really nice house, a couple of really nice cars. And because I've been given a sort of, luckily got a pilot's license with that, that job I got offered, I, thought, I would like to buy a plane. I would like to buy a boat. So I was I was researching uh, in my early 20s, like, what's the cheapest plane on the planet you can buy? And it was like 30 grand. You're like, ah. So I know I need that for that. And you're like, what's a good speedboat worth? 25, 30 grand. So, okay, I need that for that. And then what's the cars I want? Okay, so I'll need to save that for that. And then what's a house going to be? Well, that just depends on deposit and mortgage. So I need to start buying houses now and, and sort of working my way up towards the house I want. And if I can get that in my mid-30s, my life's a dream. And then when you understand Bitcoin and as you go through that journey and that baptism fire of stress in Bitcoin, now, what do I want in life? Time. Just more time with friends, more time with family, more time doing things that I enjoy. Um, and other than time... <laughs> and family uh, and safety and security and just happiness there's not much more i'm bothered about owning i, I want to own my own time I, and i'm sure like let's i um 
it doesn't matter how advanced Bitcoiners and how, how ethical they all become and how much they preach Robin, they will always, <laughs> it will always boil down in some manner to what is the value worth in comparison with the goods. Or, until fiat has disappeared, what is the value worth in comparison with the value of fiat? So don't get me wrong. If 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 a number went up dramatically, the time I spent on holidays would increase. <laughs> the standard of those holidays would increase. I might even rent a boat for a few days on one, or <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, and you might rent a nice car through your business or whatever it might be. So you you might rent the assets that you you enjoy, and I'm sure plenty of people will. But the mindset's completely changed from point of view of of looking at material things like that and thinking, oh, I want that. I've probably got one material thing that has lasted from before Bitcoin and it's just a watch that I bought just for a special occasion and that's it. I mean, everything else is... I've not sold all my chairs. Don't tell Mike I've got eight chairs in the house. But... <laughs> I, I heard that story a lot, like Bitcoiners value their time more and more when, when they get Bitcoin and they value less than material things. And they have like... First of all, it's completely uh, up to everybody what they are spending their time with and what they are spending their uh, Bitcoin with. Um, because sometimes I get this argument, oh, but uh, I, I want to spend my Bitcoin. I'm like, oh, go for it. <laughs> I don't yeah, care. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I choose to hold them uh, as long as I can. And uh, there, there's also an interesting topic that I talked, I think, a few podcasts ago uh, with retirement. And we kind of came to the conclusion that the the best form of retirement is finding something you love to do that gives you the income to pay the bills. That, that's, yeah, like yeah. The best, that's the best form of retirement. And when you can, on top of that stack, uh, Satoshis, uh, where you can live off them for yeah, like a year, maybe 10 years, maybe even 20 years, maybe even unlimited years because you have a, a low cost of living and a high stack, then you're basically free. You can do whatever you want. If you yeah, want to yeah. take a one year vac vacation and travel the world, do it because you have the means to do it. And that's, that's the ultimate goal, uh, I guess, in, in, in life, have, having freedom uh, to, to travel wherever you want, uh, have the freedom to spend time with the family you want and have the freedom to, to do whatever you, you want. And, uh, that's, that's a way better dream than, yeah, I want the Bugatti in my garage. And there's nothing yeah, wrong yeah. with a Bugatti in, in your garage. No, uh, but that, that's where the money will distribute accordingly based yeah. on how, how much conviction someone's got. Uh, definitely. If you want to um, sell your Bitcoin to buy a Bugatti, go ahead. But you know, <laughs> no, People are going to become less and less impressed with that in the future, which is a, a nicer future. Because you sit outside a nice restaurant now and... Mm, but not necessarily the most likable person would probably pull up in a Bugatti or a Ferrari. <laughs> not necessarily the one you want to sit with at the bar and talk to, but they want to be seen. And mm. Bitcoiners just don't seem to have that showy, like, in-your-face new money mentality that, that, mm. that new money's tended to show over the last 30, 40 years. Mm. Um, and they have more of what you would probably deem old money mentality who tend to drive old Volvos or... Land Rover Defenders and 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 value their time more. Bitcoin's like new old money. And you know it's going to last. Yeah, definitely. And and I have so many questions prepared uh, that we just did not cover. <laughs> it's like, it's like <laughs> our, our um, one last uh, question I have. It's like a, a double question. One thing. Um, as you adopted the Bitcoin standard, you probably know some some pitfalls that you you went through, and and you some some tips maybe for other people. Um, what what are the reasons why someone should uh, adopt the Bitcoin standard or put some Bitcoin on the balance sheet uh, in their own company? And are there like reasons when Bitcoin when companies should not do that? Like for example, for unprofitable company starting out, like do you have some 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 reasons why you should do it, why you should not do it. Some, some, maybe even common mistakes that you see uh, people doing with when they're adopting a Bitcoin standard. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, what what I would say is if if it's an unprofitable business and and it's always going to be an unprofitable business, then Fiat Fiat World does allow you to continue in some respects on that, but it's not a good idea. And 
if if we start this conversation on basic because we are unprofitable businesses that are scaling and that are trying to sort of that have got a roadmap to become profitable um but let's just take for example any profitable business ideally it's owned and managed or there's two or three shareholders who can make this decision have this decision so um the types of business i would say you want to look at it can go from the small business if you own a shop or you own a bar or you own a hairdresser or you're a self-employed individual then it is simply a case of using it as a savings vehicle and a savings vehicle that you can keep within your limited company structure and you can borrow against in future if you're a slightly larger business and you're a business that's got staff and got significant responsibilities long term then what you probably want to I wouldn't recommend anybody's specific allocation. I think if you've held a cash reserve for a few years that has not been touched, that indicates to you that you have a significant amount of cash dwindling in purchasing power that could have been used as a Bitcoin treasury. And you could probably switch that over over a sort of... A, right now, I'd recommend a pretty quick period of time. But I would usually always recommend just treating Bitcoin as you would personally, which is DCAing. Um, but fundamentally, if you've got a profitable business and you can make the decision, then you can use Bitcoin in two two ways on your balance sheet. One as an intangible asset and as basically a store of value on your balance sheet as a treasury item. And two, you can take payment in Bitcoin as well. And then you can do both. You can have it in your P&L or you can have it as a treasury item. The reasons I would say as a business owner that you would want to to look at bitcoin is owning a business is very stressful and you've got a lot of ex you've got a lot of responsibility to make decisions on behalf of other people and in order to grow that business people want to see growth so you, you might be looking at like let's say it's a profitable business most people are looking to grow and either take on debt to grow the business to increase the value of the business or they're looking to uh, release equity to a private equity firm to bring in cash and increase the value of that business by growing that business. What Bitcoin allows you to do is not to worry about either of them two things. So as long as your business is profitable, it can stay, it can stay um, good forever and become more valuable. So what it, what it means you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about acquiring competitors in a race to, to find growth as fast as possible and stretching your personal resources and your business's resources because acquiring companies is a headache and takes your eye off your own business. You don't have to, what, what you previously used to have to do is you have to look for a store of value long-term for your business. So you don't have to necessarily look at, if, if you're worried about buying commercial property, so you own your own offices, or you're looking at buying commercial property through your pension scheme, so you own some kind of commercial property so that you can sort of store value and gain some kind of income and makes it make it tax efficient. That applies for UK. I believe it applies to a few other countries as well. Um, you don't have to look at purchasing property, but you can't liquidate fast and you can't and, and also brings about liabilities. Um, you don't have to worry as much about you know when all businesses go through through ups and downs sometimes when you're in, when you're in them downs you might need um cash flow and and you might look at debt and loans but what you don't need to do is worry as much about how your balance sheet looks if you've got a bitcoin balance sheet because it, the solution to that is there are now companies who will allow you to borrow against your bitcoin and i believe over over time and over future them companies intend it to be better, but it will eventually become better when it comes to interest rates, when it comes to loan to value, and when it comes to mark to market for value for a margin call on that borrowing against your own Bitcoin. So what it does is it takes a it takes away a lot of headaches that take a lot of time with lawyers and take a lot of time with accountants and take a lot of energy from you running your business and allows you to just focus on organically growing your business in the manner that you know is best. You don't have to overcomplicate the matter. So that's why I would say putting it on the on the balance sheet of a business like that. Um, and and there's, 
the UK I can speak for from supplier perspective, and I only ever really mention, or try to only mention suppliers when I've met them face to face and had a conversation with them, because as everybody who's ever run a podcast knows, Robin, you are at the whim of taking sponsors. And if something goes wrong with that sponsor in a few years, everyone's on you about it. Um, so I've used Co- Coin Corner in the UK um, to, to allow me to purchase on the balance sheet. And to talk you through how to do that, you would open an account with them with your limited business, whether you're doing that for your main operating business or whether you set up a special purpose vehicle to do so. And you'll get an e-money account. That means that you, your risk of debanking has minimized quite a lot with that. So you can send money to that e-money account without your bank necessarily questioning where it's going because it's an account in your own business's name that's within the Coin Corner sort of platform. And you can you can change the payments to DCA and you can set up automatic payments to start stacking within Coin Corner. Coin Corner, great exchange, but don't leave your Bitcoin on an exchange. You want to be thinking about the next step of cold storage and security. So if you're an owner, managed business owner, you, you want to be thinking, I mean, I've, I've, I don't mind sharing a little bit about how I would manage security as a recommendation. It doesn't necessarily mean this is my way of doing it, but you then want to look at a company like an on, an Unchained or one of the multi-sig storage firms. I think there's one in the UK, but I can't remember the name of it right now and I've not used it. Um, so you want to look at multi-sig and then you want to start researching how best to secure your assets, which may mean multiple safety security boxes in multiple jurisdictions. And you might you might want to be vetting and meeting the senior management who own their businesses to make sure that you know how they operate and how they've dealt with um, issues in the past or whatever it might be. You want to know how many years that safety deposit box has been there without anybody getting into into the building. So you've got the practical aspect of buying it, custodying it in uh, multi-sig. And if you've got multiple shareholders, then you might want a multi-sig where multiple shareholders all have a key. Um, and then you want to be having a conversation with your accountants as well and trying to educate your accountants on how to account for it because your accountants and your solicitors might not understand the asset. So you, you, you're kind of coaching them into understanding where they're going to account for it on your balance sheet. And that probably sounds quite simple and it, it is very simple. But like I say, stick to the same principles you would as a, a uh, individual investor you want to make sure you've got a healthy cash balance and that you're not putting the business at risk from a cash flow perspective you want to make sure ideally you're dca in and you're matching your investment to your conviction and your strategy so if you're at the early stages of understanding bitcoin be at the early stages of allocating because there is nothing more guaranteed than someone making a large sizable purchase of bitcoin and the price dropping in the next five minutes after they've done so that is a guaranteed Bitcoin law. Um, so that, that's that's putting on the balance sheet and the things you can do with that, such as borrow against it, just giving you a bit more freedom. Um, you can also do things against it. So if, if you were, let's say, um, you were looking to exit your business in, in however many years or you want to stay in it. I know personally, I see myself being in my business forever. Um, but I also see the staff being able to take shares in the business and the people who've built the business being able to take more of a control sort of have more control and more shares in business over the long term as i become more of a um hands-off business owner what what having a bitcoin balance sheet and having that kind of asset on there allows you to do is is effectively either exit your business or allow a management buyout or something along their lines to happen and use the bitcoin as a transferring species so you can you can realize um the sale value from the business without necessarily having to have saved it up in commercial property or other assets that are just difficult to hold difficult to liquidate and difficult to manage i i could i couldn't i couldn't sell um you couldn't sell five percent of a commercial property in 10 minutes if you needed to as a business owner and you couldn't borrow against it either but that tends to be the route that we go down when it comes to adding long-term stores of value to the balance sheets so that's why I would say add it to the balance sheet. Robin, I hope that covers the balance sheet aspects. But if you want to take payment in it, companies in the UK, I don't know further afield, but Musket with the payment terminals at the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got small 
bars, restaurants, all that kind of stuff. If they want to take payment in Bitcoin and get used to it, then then you've got companies like Musket who allow you to do lightning payments immediately and the businesses can get used to, to using Bitcoin. And I, and I think to, to sort of summarize and, and wrap the business side of it up, the more people like yourself and the more we all orange pill people and we bring your friends, family, relatives, the businesses you come into contact with onto a Bitcoin standard in their personal lives and their business lives, the more leverage the Bitcoin community will have to bring about the more positive future that we all want for the world. So if everybody's transacting in Lightning in every shop in your city, the changes that we need from reg- regulators and legislators when it comes to recognising it as a cash equivalent on businesses' profit and loss and balance sheets so you're not getting taxed for capital gains when you're transacting in a bit in, in Bitcoin will all come about far quicker the more the adoption increases and especially from businesses accepting payment in Bitcoin, which is why, albeit I don't plan to ever sell, I do purchase in Bitcoin if a business allows it and I do ask everywhere I go pretty much do they accept it now and I do always tip in Bitcoin if you're in a bar or a restaurant it's easy to orange pill someone when they're being paid to listen to you at the other side of a bar (laughs) it's a a great strategy and I think this is the the grassroots movement that we also need that we just go in the restaurants, we go go in bars, we go in electronic shops, whatever it is, and ask, hey, do you also accept Bitcoin? And if they say no, then yeah, it's card or cash. But the, just asking the question um, is, a, is a big contribution because then they're like, oh, someone wanted to pay with Bitcoin. And maybe next week there's someone coming there who also asked that question. <laughs> uh, and and, and, th- and then, then it compounds. And at, at some point, there will be so many people asking that he will be like, hmm, maybe I should uh, accept Bitcoin. Or maybe there's someone from a provider coming and like, hey, do you want to accept Bitcoin uh, in, in, in your shop? I have a service for you. Like, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 those things uh, accumulate. And at some point, the shops will accept Bitcoin. It's just a matter of yeah. time, a matter of adoption. And we are right now. We are not at a, in a at a big stage. On I think the number was like we needed around four percent of the world population uh, being intolerant, intolerant about not paying in Bitcoin. <laughs> like they have to pay <laughs> Bitcoin. Uh, when yeah, we yeah. reach that kind of a point, then we we come to a, a, a bigger scale a, a adoption. Yeah across the chasm on the adoption and uh, on on that note there the are businesses in 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 britain bridge to bitcoin that, that that pretty much i think voluntarily just helps businesses adopt a bitcoin standard but usually i think they're, they're quite often speaking to merchants and small businesses and get them on board um they're doing great work as well and and i think i should should rightly mention them alongside the likes of musket um and and when you were saying about people asking about Bitcoin payments, um, I was in a bar with a Bitcoiner recently and was saying, why don't we ask other people to just randomly start asking behind this bar do we accept Bitcoin and just like, <laughs> even if they don't understand Bitcoin, just go to, when you're at the bar, just ask if you accept Bitcoin just to get the conversation happening more. <laughs> That, that's what uh, Red Bull, uh, the Austrian company, actually did in the beginning when they started off. They paid people uh, to ask for to Red ask, Bull. Do you serve Red Bull? <laughs> yeah. So that, that was a, an, an amazing marketing strategy. They just like send a bunch of people like the weeks before in the hey, do you have Red Bull? Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull. And then after a month, the Red Bull salesperson came in and like, hey, do you want to accept Red Bull in in your? <laughs> so, so uh, you might therapy. you might be onto something there, Robin. That might be uh, that might be a pretty good idea. Finally, we 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 need an organized group that just like goes to all the restaurants <laughs> bars out for, for Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, perfect. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we, before we come to the end routine, I have one last question that I ask all my my guests um, because I think Bitcoiners are extremely interesting people, and I want to uh, get to know them better. Um, what are you currently passionate about? Besides Bitcoin, like what be, besides Bitcoin, uh, is there any topic or activity that you're really passionate about? Wow, that is a, that is a tough question to end on. Um, 
is there anything I'm passionate about outside of Bitcoin? It dominates my mindset quite a lot of the time. The, the, the other thing I'm passionate about is obviously my business and the, and the staff there, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wonder um, where the previous answers might have, have gone there because everything comes back to Bitcoin in some manner or, 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 or in some way. Um, you've got me. What am I passionate about outside of Bitcoin? I would say um, there's nothing I am anywhere near as passionate about outside of Bitcoin other than obviously um, my wife and uh, my family and my friends and my time. And I'm spending more time with my dog now in the morning because Bitcoin buys your time. So I'm passionate about walking my dog. I'm passionate about um, using my leisure time to be happy and enjoy myself more. But if I was to give you just what interests me, but I'm technically not particularly minded, I believe that AI is a pretty interesting topic to be looking into at the moment. And I'm starting to read into and 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 become passionate about understanding how that ties in with businesses and with open source um projects like in nostra uh, and and where that's going to go in the next 10 to 20 years but all of that ties back into ai is not going to take micropayments from another ai unless it's sound money because ai is going to be intelligent enough to know bitcoin is the solution <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it's an interesting question because there, there are so many uh, interesting answers coming up. And, and I, I, I did it, I think, once in a podcast and I like the answer so much and I just keep going. So like, it's kind of my new end routine in the podcast, but my actual end routine that I have since the first ever podcast, I uh, knew my 137th uh, podcast today. Um, is is the previous guest is asking a question for for the next guest and the question from the previous guest to you is uh do you think that fiat will survive over the next 100 years and if so uh which one will be the biggest one i mean uh, first off like that's an impossible to to answer question but it's it's interesting what you think about it <laughs> I, I i but i but my gut feeling is fiat will still be here in 100 years because quite a lot of the absolutely appalling currencies that have died in the last 20 years are still here now and being enforced as legal tender, even though they benefit nobody. So I believe fiat will still be here in 100 years, but I believe we'll have whittled it down to just a few that people will actually touch. And which one do I think is going to be the one that, that survives? I'm not sure I could call that answer yet, but I believe it will be the first one to heavily back itself with probably a combination of gold and Bitcoin because I don't think anyone will rush, any nation states will rush to back their currency with just Bitcoin because as soon as they do, they open the floodgates for everybody understanding that this is the future and it doesn't matter whether they back their fiat with it. People are just going to buy Bitcoin. So I think they'll try and come up with a confusing way to back their currency with a, a, a variety of assets. And they'll just slyly put Bitcoin in there and buy as much as they possibly can with their easy to print fiat. So I think the first one that does that will be the one that survives. Likely to be one that's, that's around today. And I think uh, as much as you don't like to say it, I think the US dollar is probably going to be the one that makes it out of all of them if any yeah US dollar is strong and they even in the bitcoin uh conversation they just further had than uh the U than europe is i watched the european election i watched the austrian election there's not even a word of bitcoin about crypto about anything like that no. uh, and and when you listen to trump uh, he's accepting bitcoin he's talking about it even now i heard something with biden that he's also now turning a little bit more crypto uh, yeah, yeah, I heard some some something about that, but I did not uh, deeply research about that. So you just have to like they are just a little bit further ahead again uh, before the European Union. I don't know about China how what, what they will do with Bitcoin. Obviously, they did try to get rid of it, but obviously they failed until now since since eleven it years. It doesn't ago. mean it doesn't mean that they're not stacking it. 
Um, Very true. And, and, and I think they will they will acquire Bitcoin in slime roundabout ways. So you look at the um, the the confiscation is the way that nation states are securing Bitcoin at the moment. I don't know whether the UK has the keys for the 61,000 that they confiscated. Um, but obviously the US have the keys for the, the Bitcoin they confiscated, uh, which is a hot topic at the moment. But but Bitcoin is apolitical and they were all, there's, there's benefits to every single um, subset of political opinions or social demographics. Bitcoin benefits them all in some way. So um, all politicians will eventually have to come round to it. Um, but yeah, it's be- it's becoming a it's becoming a hot topic. Absolutely, hot absolutely. Topic, which is good to see. The more people speak about it, the more it comes up in normal conversation, and the, the better it is for Bitcoin. Everything benefits Bitcoin in the long term. Perfect. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. Um, before I let you go, before we can let you go, um, where can people find you? Where can people reach out to you, ask you questions? Uh... I'm on um, X uh, with the handle at Bitcoin Only Scott, which is BTC Only Scott. Um, so if you want to find me on there or ask me any questions or drop me a DM if you've got any questions, then I'd happily... I could say if, if it's if it's somebody in the UK I can probably offer them a bit of advice if they're looking to put it onto their balance sheet from point of making me introductions to the right people and and, and talking them through any questions they've got. Or just having a conversation. Perfect. Then, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Scott, for for being on and for everybody listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Robin. Keep doing what you're doing.